Boy, we need more of that. <laughs> I think we ought to play it from all the buildings all around town, all around the state and the country and the world. That just brings you right in, you know. Beautiful, beautiful. We're very, very fortunate. We're going to now transition into a discussion, to broaden our discussion that we started earlier. Um, I'd like to come back to this question, maybe to start it with, and that is, uh, when we're not in the space, if we're not, you know, if, if we are attaching and grabbing and we find our heart is kind of a bit closed and we're under a lot of stress and we have time is issues, you know, what can we do to try to loosen that tight grip and to find that home, that place of compassion? Maybe I'll uh, start because um, I, I had the privilege to develop a eight week compassion training uh, program at Stanford uh, known as CCT or Compassion Cultivation Training, um, which is now going to be offered more widely through another nonprofit entity called Compassion Institute, which has just recently been set up. Um, this question of impartiality versus attachment and whether or not that is a stumbling block um, was an important question um, because in a natural state, um, the compassion that we all know is the compassion that we naturally feel for our loved ones. Um, so, and you know, uh, Ingrid, you pointed out about the, the kind of the imagery of the mother's womb uh, as, as kind of image. And in the Buddhist text, in the Metta Sutta, for example, the discourse on loving kindness, the Buddha actually gives the imagery of the mother's unconditional love for, your, for her child as the measure of having developed compassion for all beings. But on the other hand, um, you know, to ask that at the beginning is just too, too much of a tall order. So how do we then proceed? And one of the things that I struggled with is really this question of attachment. How do you take it gently, you know, really kind of utilize what nature has gifted you from a scientific language, you know? I mean, we all have this impulse to care for our loved ones. And then gently build it up on this. And here, one thing that I found very helpful is in the Buddhist kind of, you know, psychology, there is this powerful insight that empathy for another person really presupposes a certain idea of uh, an identification a sense of connection with the other. And that's one of the reasons why we have in-groups and out-groups, and for the out-group, we don't feel for their pain, because we have chosen not to identify with them. And that's also the reason why, in the case of an acute pain, we're able to feel this even to a total stranger, because the pain is a powerful connector. You know, when someone is in total agony, that cuts right through all the layers of discrimination, label, and all the rest, because mm -hmm. the fundamental reality of human experience speaks to our understanding of pain mm -hmm. and you know, instinctual wish to avoid it. So that's why pain is such a powerful connector. Mm -hmm. So we have used this, and this is actually how in the Buddhist meditation proceeds as well. So in a sense, what you're doing is, instead of getting rid of your attachment to your loved ones and to your small circle, we actually build on it to really say, well, basically what you're doing is you are expanding the scope of your identification. And you do that by reflecting deeply upon the shared humanity. And we use this meditation called Just Like Me. Just like me, he wishes to be happy. Just like me. He doesn't want to have problem. Mm -hmm. And that way, we're really getting to this very fundamental level of reality of human condition, where vulnerability to suffering, to pain, all of this is part of what makes who we are. Um, and so that's the approach we have used, so that it's, I suppose, in a sense, it's kind of gently leading by the hand <laughs> in a kind of a softly, softly way. Mm. So that's how we have tackled that issue because mm. in the end, the highest form of compassion does presuppose impartiality. Mm. I mean, it's a kind of a, in, in some case, it's a kind of a, it doesn't really matter who the other person mm -hmm. is. It's a bit like the notion of justice. The mm -hmm. reason why we put 
Lady Liberty has a blindfolded, mm -hmm. is that the recipient of the justice shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. White, black, Asian, mm -hmm. Asiatic, educated or uneducated, justice is impartial. Mm -hmm. And the highest form of compassion is, in fact, an impartial. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter whose suffering it is. Suffering is suffering, full stop. You respond to it. But to get there is a real challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how these are sort of complementary approaches. Uh, one that you're talking about is to start with a, a small circle in which you can count that empathy will be sure. reliable sure. and gradually extend the membership of that circle. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's a good, and using the term identification that way to just say that we become identified with the whole of sentient being. Sure. And the other that I think is complementary is to just spot attachment wherever it occurs and realize that if you could, you could drop it altogether so that, yeah, what makes you so special, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, you know that, uh, that, that what remains by default is compassion. It's a wager. Mm -hmm. but, but in response to your question, I would say that one of the things you can do when you notice you're in a bad state there's something that notices that, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. wonderful. I mean, when you, to, to say, to notice, oh, you know, my heart is stressed. If you, if you could just begin to create and collect a data bank that says that nothing good can come out of a heart that's mm -hmm. braced, mm -hmm. defended, and attached, no matter how just your cause, if you're, <laughs> it, it, the, the energetic component is always stronger than, the, than your so as you just notice, mm. ah, you know, mm. angry, tight. Just the act of noticing, even if you can't shift the state, will already shift the state. Mm. You know, yeah. mm. it, it's much more important than than anyone would think. Mm. Think Sounds you. very much to me like a Zogchenpa, a deep practitioner of Zogchen. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Ingrid. Mm -hmm. I mean, regular. Uh, practices of breaking those attachments temporarily help us. And, and this is why um, fasting, breaking the attachment hmm. to um, not only food, but act, that, that conviviality that happens of hmm. eating with other people hmm. that's so important to creating connection. Hmm. Um, also, the energy that starts to drain, so you don't, you're not as, you know, when, when you're really well fed and well rested and you've got all this energy and it's like, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to accomplish this. Mm -hmm. But when, when that's taken away from you, you have a little bit less energy and then you're like, hmm, you know what, having a little bit less energy allows you to see some other things. So mm -hmm. I think those. To, to be able to integrate some of those detachment practices, you know, ascetic practices, whatever we would call it, uh, fasting for a time, halwa mm. withdrawing mm. from people for a time. Mm. Mm. So um, that's something that can be part of fasting for Muslims during Ramadan. It can be part of the fast of Ramadan is actually detaching yourself for a while from your home, from your family. Um, giving away those things, constantly divesting, divesting ourselves mm -hmm. of those mm -hmm. things that we love. Mm -hmm. But another way I think is, um, and this is a, you know, it's a long spiritual tradition, is, is travel and going away for a while, making yourself really completely vulnerable to um, putting yourself in a place where you don't have attachments. You mm -hmm. can't rely on mm -hmm. those that community or friends or family that you're used to doing so much for mm. and them doing for you. When you're in that situation of complete vulnerability, um, suddenly you see how it's all there still, you know? You, 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 see, you see everywhere, you see kindness and goodness and, um, and then you're able to say, well, you know, I thought I was just building this up here. I thought it relied on me. I thought, I thought everything was dependent on me and us building this up. But I think it's that being vulnerable um, through travel, through detachment, going away for a while, 
and coming back mm. is, is very helpful. Mm. Mm. You mentioned Mahasabha. I didn't pronounce, did I pronounce it right? Ingrid? Uh, I didn't pronounce it right. Mm. Ma <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I might know you. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's on the wrong part. Uh, Mahasabha? Oh, Mahasabha. Mahasabha. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. thank Taking you. Into account. <laughs> it's, it's like, a, it's accounting, really. Literally, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's accounting. So, to, and this can be done, of course, we can do it any time, but it's good to have a discipline of doing it at certain mm -hmm. times mm -hmm. to get in the practice, mm -hmm. to, to start to make it a habit. Mm -hmm. um, and then we notice when these things are arising. So if we make it a regular practice, say, in the morning or the evening, taking into account what are my negative emotions, mm -hmm. envy, anger, um, hopelessness, um, spite, uh, all of these things, if I'm, if I'm taking those into account in, in a peaceful state, mm -hmm. remembering them, counting them up, and then saying, okay, those happened, I'm gonna, do, letting them go, I'm going to do better mm -hmm. next time. Then when mm -hmm. they arise mm -hmm. during the, the moment during the day, as they come up in, in that moment, we're gonna be able to recognize them mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. easily and then mm. be able to, to back away mm. from that. So I think that's a, um, like so many things, at first we need to, this is where the discipline comes in and where the teachers and the helpers to help us get in the habit of doing these things until they become natural, mm. until you know, we might not even need to have them in our calendar anymore mm. because they become <laughs> part of our state. So there was a, a great uh, saint, a Buddhist saint, about a thousand years ago, Dipankara Atisha. And uh, it's said that uh, the story is, the legend, that when he noticed a negative thought or feeling, he would put a little black stone. And when he noticed a positive feeling or thought, he'd put a white stone. <laughs> And at first, there were these big, huge masses of black stones. <laughs> Couldn't even see anything white. And then slowly, you know, with just recognition. Mm -hmm. Of course, I think he probably did more than just recognition. But recognition was a powerful part of this. The, it shifted. And eventually, you know, there was a bigger pile of white stones. Mm -hmm. So doing this Mahasabha, Mahasabha mm -hmm. thank you, mm -hmm. is quite powerful. So I guess I need to direct it here. So let's see. So we went on one end. We went on one end where, you know, we're just not finding. We're not juiced. You know, we're overstressed and we're clinging and we're attached. And, um, and how can we a little bit, you know, loosen things to find some compassion? Let's go on the other extreme. Let's talk about this non-duality of letting go and just being with being compassion um, and not having any attachments. It's, yeah, let's let's flesh that out a little bit, please. Well, I'd say that I think one of the dysfunctional roadmaps we've inherited from our tradition is the idea of you know of progressive enlightenment to the point that you you your, your false self drops away, and what's left is your your true self and your true self is not attached and it's non-dual and it has no identities uh, and you live in it happily ever after. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's sent generations of people just marching right off the cliff into the river of Lala. <laughs> that, uh, that as long as we're incarnate, we bear mm. this, this wonderful, mm. difficult, excruciating task of, mm. of reconciling with them in our own being, the one and the many, the particular and the universal, mm. the, the one who can live perfectly, happily, and comfortably mm -hmm. in that, that non-aligned state, and the one who is all of a sudden, oh my God, my child has just died. I mean, and these are the two parts there, the, the Christian language would be the crucifixion, the glory of our being. Mm. And so to learn how mm. to keep them in a wise dialogue, mm -hmm. rather than trying to use the spiritual 
to devalue and flatten and frankly mm -hmm. retress mm -hmm. the temporal. And I thought I think a lot of the bad press that non-duality has gotten nowadays mm -hmm. is because we've used it that way. For, mm -hmm. We've used mm -hmm. the high side for spiritual bypassing. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about an integrated approach, and sometimes, frankly, it's, it's important to work out of that small self. Sometimes that mm -hmm. kind of karate chop energy mm -hmm. is what needs to be brought to a situation. Mm -hmm. But it will work better if it's already deeply grounded in a lived experience mm -hmm. that that other is also real in you. So that would be my... Mm. my Lovely. Comments, reflections, reactions? Well, um, yeah, thank you for that, because sometimes um, listening to spiritual perspectives, particularly on compassion, tends to make it unreachable, you yeah. know, it's mm -hmm. up there. And when in reality, compassion and these qualities are part of our everyday reality, you know, we may not be particularly articulate, many of us, or we may not be pay much attention to it, but it, that's, that's there. Um, so thank you for that clarification. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things for me, uh, coming from the Buddhist tradition, is the, and which here I think the Buddhist tradition is actually quite close to the, the, the scientific understanding that compassion as a felt response um, is, I think, really contingent upon a concrete reality. Um, I mean, this is the reason why there is something called you know, altruism co collapse. So we are able to feel compassion for individuals. And then after a certain number, you know, we just can't maintain that. There's a kind of a certain finite numbers beyond which. So for example, there's a reason why charity commercials use real children mm -hmm. rather than give you statistics. You know, we don't respond to, you know, your dollar will cover this amount of people, that X amount of people suffering. That doesn't appeal to us. That doesn't pull at our, you know, tug at our heart. But a child suffering and asking for something really pulls and tug at our heart. So, and that is the reality of our compassionate response. So, compassion as a felt response really seems to require individuals human beings, suffering, need. But compassion, so I would like to see a distinction between compassion as a felt response and compassion as a kind of a, almost one could say, a standpoint, a perspective. Yeah. Now, compassion as a perspective, you don't need concrete, because you are now working at the level of your intention. Mm -hmm. You're working at the level of motivation, your character development, so that you are primed to respond to any situation in a compassionate way, but your actual compassionate training doesn't really involve concrete reality. And this is how, so in, and in that way, when you generate compassion, you can generate compassion for all beings, mm -hmm. because you don't need mm -hmm. individuals to inspire that compassion. Mm -hmm. But I think to get there, I think we need to somehow cultivate that felt compassion, mm -hmm. which requires, which does require real suffering, which does require the perception of real need. And in a way, that's a kind of a, you know, maybe a dichotomy, but I, that's why I thank you very much for pointing out that it's a kind of a both path. Mm -hmm. You need to somehow, you cannot undermine the other at the expense exactly. of, of one. Yeah. Would you agree with that? I would certainly, yeah. exactly, and I think that we've done so much damage in the spiritual path by pitting the two selves against each other, rather than understanding that they vastly extend the range of one self. Thank you. Hmm. I think part of compassion as, as a perspective is related to what I would call, is related to trust. Mm -hmm. what, what we call tawakkul. So, and what I trust for, is that when I say, when I look at, at compassion as a perspective, is that, is that I know because this is what is the, the form, the substance of, of being, 
that it's that it's okay. I know that you know, I come to Louisville and I'm gonna find all these compassionate people and all these compassionate things going on. And I don't have to be I don't have to stay here and work on every project and so I know when I when these when we we see there's so much going on, but we don't become overwhelmed by it because we, we have trust. We tr have that trusting knowledge, awareness that it is, it is there too. You know, we're, if we, if we think of ourselves here and I have to work on this in my realm and this is what's in, in front of me, I, I, I'm not worried that nothing's going on over there. And I think that's, it's really important to have hmm. have that, so it's not detachment and and I don't care or it doesn't affect me, but I know that that it's happening in everywhere. It's one, you know, it's one, it's one sheet. It's the warp and weft of of the universe, and so I think that trust is so related uh, to the perspective of compassion. Hmm. This is beautiful. We're just warming up and we have to finish. Um, so I hope that this discussion will continue with all of you. And, uh, um, and we now, I now would like to introduce Halid Hatik.